I meant what I said about being grateful to be here and for this opportunity and this group of people. But I also have to say, if we hadn't done this show, if you guys hadn't done this show, let's face it, there would have been riots. <laughs> you didn't have a whole lot of choice. I mean, if you've seen this movie Godzilla, it would have been like that, only without the monster just rage at the TV. There would have been revolutions in the Ukraine. I mean, uh, it's amazing, right? It's an amazing vibe here and an amazing group. So glad to be here and ready to have a good time. All right. And we don't have our whole cast here uh, just because of dates and bookings and logistical issues. We so see it, who cares. Okay. <laughs> so it's a, yes, they do. They are, they are very important. Um, so we have a, a real team effort here with our writers and some of our other collaborators, collaborators reading roles. Um, Bob is going to do Gene Saul, Jimmy. Uh, Jonathan Banks is going to do Mike. Peter Gould is going to be Chuck. Uh, Patrick Fabian is going to be <laughs> Howard Hamlin. Uh, Ray Seahorn, Kim. Um, Jen Carroll is going to read Abuelita. Jenny Hutchison, Brenda. Daniel Levine, Cal. Stephen Levine, Lars. Sharon Bialy, our fantastic casting director, chief clerk, and Mrs. Nguyen. Um, our hacksaw boy, Defendant one is, of course, uh, Tom Schnauz. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> obviously. Our second defendant, Bradley Paul, our Bessie Kettleman, uh, Heather Marion, uh, Craig Kettleman, uh, Gordon Smith, and screen direction, Brett Dos Santos. Okay, guys, here we go. Better Call Saul, episode 101 teaser. Scene one, macro close on a spiral, which fills the frame, lazily spinning like a hypno disc. We re realize it's a Cinnabon, and as we pull away from it, it gets coated with icing. And now we see there's a whole tray of them waiting to be slathered with creamy white goodness, for indeed we are inside a Cinnabon store. As a female employee puts the finishing touches on these pastries, another young employee slides a tray into the oven. We see macro close-ups, coffee dripping, cold heating elements, etc. And all of this, every image in the entire teaser is shown in glorious black and white. The place is fairly busy with customers. There's also a middle-aged manager, close on his name tag, says Gene. Gene's got unhip glasses, a walrus mustache, and dark, thinning hair. He goes about his work briskly and efficiently, exuding neither personality nor attitude. Honestly, we wouldn't give this man a second glance, except that we used to know him as Saul Goodman. We are looking at a fugitive from justice. Exactly as predicted at the end of the Breaking Bad, Saul now manages a Cinnabon in Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> now, this is cut and dried stuff we're watching. It's a day in the life of a restaurant. Nothing more, we hear only snippets of conversation. No emotions on display, neither happy nor sad. It's simply work. Helping out an employee, Gene expertly packages an order to go. Handing it off, he double takes, noticing something. There's a customer sitting at a two-top way in the back of the store. And he's hard to tell through those glasses he's wearing, but he seems to be staring at Gene intently. Whatever Gene's doing, it ceases. He blinks and stares back. Sunglasses rises to his feet and starts walking towards us. We creep in on Gene, who exhibits the first hint of emotion we've witnessed, fear. And though he tries to hide it, it's growing. Clearly, the fugitive Saul Goodman has just been recognized. His time on the run has reached an end. Except, Sunglasses now walks right past Gene. Gene's head swivels with this guy who pads out the door and waves to a friend outside. We suddenly realize the guy's stare only seemed to be directed at Gene. It never actually was. Gene gives a secret sigh of relief, and Willie's his heart beat back to 140. Again, he's on autopilot, back to the grind. Scene two, we cut exterior of a townhouse complex at night, cookie cutter townhouses, depressing. This is where Larry from Three's Company went to die. <laughs> Inside the apartment, downstairs at night, ice cubes clunk into a highball glass, drambuie and some sort of off-brand scotch gets poured, making a rusty nail. Instead of a twist of lemon, there's an unceremonious squirt from one of those little lemon-shaped juice bottles. Gene slurps the excess off his drink, walks into the living room. This place has zero personality, Oakwood vibe. Gene plops down on the sectional, fires up his flat screen. He channel serves, finding something he can tolerate, sipping his rusty nail and staring straight through the TV. A thought eventually strikes him. He sets down his drink, rises, heads for the stairs. But before he goes, he pauses to check the window blinds. They're closed tight, complete privacy. Black frame, door opens and light floods in. We realize we're in a closet. 
Gene kneels to pull a couple of familiar suitcases out of the way. We'll recall he had these when he took his leave in episode 515 of Breaking Bad. With the suitcases removed, a hatch is revealed, cut into the drywall at the back of the closet. Now Gene removes from it a dented old shoebox. Steel kneeling, Gene opens the box, and we get a glimpse inside as he sifts through its contents. There are papers, some old photos, a fat stack of Mexican pesos. There's an old tin Band-Aid box that rattles like a half full of pebbles. And lastly, there's an unmarked VHS tape. This is what Gene came for. He cradles it in his hands. Back downstairs at night, the tape gets pressed into a VCR. Gene backs into frame, settling into the sofa, never taking his eyes off the TV. He feels around in front of it for his rusty nail. We never once see what's on the TV screen, but over a bouncy musical jingle whose refrain is Better Call Saul, we hear, Hey, you, did you know you have rights? My name's Saul Goodman, attorney at law, and I'm itching for a fight with prosecutors, judges, the police, anyone who's out to ruin your day. So if you're in trouble, better call Saul. <laughs> this is the first in a series of 15 second commercials. A second one, please. And another, and another. The whole time we stay on Gene, who stares at them intently. But Gene shows no emotion. No nostalgia, no regret, not pride. His expression is unreadable as he watches. Yet there's one subtle detail we may note, which is that gradually a bit of color spuses into this black and white image. It's the light from the unseen TV. It flickers across Gene's face in blue, yellow, and red. Off these colors growing brighter, more vibrant, as dead-eyed Gene sips his drink and stares. Act one, interior courthouse courtroom, Albuquerque city seal in the frame. We're back in color. Tilt down to reveal a long-faced judge sitting at his bench, peering up at the ceiling, staring at nothing in particular. He slowly rotates in his chair left to right, right to left. We hear the squeak of the chair. That squeak is the loudest thing we hear, even though the courtroom is packed. Jurors, the alternates in the jury box, one of them coughs, another shifts in her seat, another idly scratches his ear. Someone in the crowded visitor section checks his watch. Somebody else's stomach rumbles. The court reporter examines a fingernail, then reaches for her big gulp, takes a sip. The lead prosecutor removes his readers, picks out a piece of sleep from his eyes, frowns at it on the tip of his pinky. And beside him, we see a second chair seeming to be taking notes. However, a closer look reveals this young woman is actually drawing a barbarian riding a unicorn. Over at the defense table sit three defendants. They're clean-cut white guys. They look innocent. They also look nervous, as currently they don't have a defense attorney. The defendants glance sidelong to one another, wondering where he is. We hear a creak. The judge rotates towards the bailiff, gives him a shrug. The bailiff nods, rises to his feet, and exits. We cut to a men's room. Hands are splayed apart, pressed against a white tile wall. A man is alone in here, standing as if he's assuming the position in order to be frisked. Actually, he's at a urinal, relieving himself. We don't get a good look at him at first. We're mostly on his back. He seems to be murmuring something under his breath. Whatever he's saying, we can barely hear it. Let me tell you, it's B-19 again. Yeah, because, uh, because. Meet Jimmy McGill. He's getting ready, psyching himself up. Who is Jimmy McGill, you ask? Well, you already know him as Saul Goodman, but at this particular moment, we're in 2002, Saul is a ways off in the future, and Jimmy is still going by the name he was born with. The door opens <coughs> behind him, and the bailiff sticks his head into the men's room. He gives a little whistle, says you're on. Jimmy glances over his shoulder and nods. Zip goes the fly, flush goes the urinal, Turns to the mirror, shoots his cuffs, and danger fills his tie. It's showtime. Is he nervous? Fuck no. He owns this fucking place. Back to the courtroom, black frame. Then we reveal in the courtroom Jimmy walking through, like Elvis, taking the stage at the International Hotel. All eyes are on him. O oh, to be 19 again. You with me, ladies and gentlemen? You remember 19? Because let me tell you, the juices are flowing. Those red corpuscles are corpuscling. The grass is green and soft, and summer's gonna last forever. Remember? Yeah, you do. But if you're being honest, really honest, you'll also recall you had an underdeveloped 19-year-old brain. I mean, that thing was the size of a circus peanut. Me, personally, I was, <clears throat> well, let's just say, if I was held accountable for every stupid decision I made when I was 19, <laughs> oh boy. And I bet if I were in church right now, I'd get a big amen. Which brings us to these three. Now, these three knuckleheads, and I'm sorry, boys, but that's, that's what you are. They did a dumb thing. We're not denying that. However, I would like to point out two salient facts. Now, fact one, nobody got hurt, not a soul. Very important to keep that in mind. Fact two, 
though the prosecution keeps bandying the term criminal trespass, Mr. Spinazzo, the property owner, admitted to us that he keeps most portions of his business open to the public day and night. So, trespassing. I mean, Dave, that's, that's kind of a reach, isn't it? Huh? Here's what I know. These three young men, near honor students all, <laughs> were feeling their oats one Saturday night and they, well, I, I don't know. Look, call me crazy, but I don't think they deserve to have their bright futures ruined for what amounts to a minute, momentary, never to be repeated lapse of judgment. Ladies and gentlemen, you're bigger than that. Jesus, Jimmy is good. He's confident, folksy and genuine. He's passionate and convincing. His three clients smile hopefully. Things are looking up. Except, why is the jury so very deadpan? Same goes for the judge. Didn't any of that land on these people? The prosecutor rises to his feet, makes his rebuttal. He crosses to an AV cart tucked in the corner, rolls the cart to where the jury can see it, pushes a tape into the deck, and the TV screen goes blue. And now, up comes a homemade video. Two of our young defendants are visible in it. It's handheld and shaky and seems to take place in a professional laboratory of some sort. The guys keep their voices low so as not to get caught. They're giggly and dopey, proudly documenting their exploits on camera. And what are these exploits, you ask? This is the embalming room of a funeral home. And one of the guys, hacksaw in hand, is sawing the head off an elderly male corpse. Oh, to be 19 again. <laughs> and now, as the head comes loose from the hacksaw, hacksaw boy dangles it by its white hair. <laughs> Most jurors avert their eyes, having seen this all before. The prosecutor leans against the cart with his fingers laced, staring off at the floor. This is the entirety of his rebuttal. He doesn't even need to say a word. Dude, dude, stick your wang in the throat hole. The three real-life defendants shift uncomfortably in their seat. Jimmy gives them a fake little nod and a wave off. It's going to be fine. Yeah, sure it is. We're back in the courthouse in the chief clerk's office, little stuffed animals are proudly displayed on the desk of the court's chief clerk. She's staring up through hooded eyes at Jimmy, who is in mid-rant waving a check. Now, what kind of math is that? 700 per defense? No, 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 per defendant. Three defendants, 2,100, which, by the way, Bargain, those three maniacs, what I did for them? They're going to jail, ain't they? So, since when is that? They had sex with a head. <laughs> Look, ain't nobody told you to try all three of them together. One trial, $700. So, you want me to spend nine weeks of my life, one maniac at a time, with three maniacs, skull fuck? You know what? You're going to miss me. You, you're going to miss me, because it'll be a cold day in hell before I uh, take any more PD work for this shitty court. Sayonara! Baby. And out the door he slams. The Kirk couldn't care less. Final ways in a uh, parking lot. Pissed Jimmy headed for a pearlescent white Cadillac. Of course we remember his famous car. Whoops, he doesn't own that caddy just yet. So we adjust to the vehicle parked next to it. A mid-90s Suzuki Esteem. And yes, as the name perversely implies, it's a shit box. <laughs> Jimmy plops his briefcase on the Suzuki's roof, digs for his keys. As he does, his cell phone rings. Jimmy checks the readout on his cell and his anger evaporates. Instantly, gets replaced with nervous hope. Fumbling to answer the call, he pauses to collect himself. When he speaks, it's with a British accent. Law offices of James McGill, how may I direct your call? Oh, yes, Mrs. Kettleman, so good of you to return. Actually, I don't have Mr. McGill at the moment, but I know he'd... Oh, splendid. Unfortunately, our offices are being painted and the fumes are quite horrid. Uh, could he meet you and your husband at, say, uh, Loyola's Cafe on Central? <laughs> Four o'clock, it shall be. <laughs> Cheers. Jimmy hangs up, silently pumps his fist. He checks his watch, jumps in his car, barely remembering his briefcase on the roof. As the car tears off, we find ourselves at a cashier booth, a guard arm blocking the exit as the esteem comes to a quick stop in front of it. Jimmy hands his ticket to the parking attendant. We angle past this attendant, not seeing his face. Three dollars. I'm validated. See the stickers? <coughs> I see five stickers, but you're one shy. It's three dollars. Do we recognize this voice? <laughs> Boy, it sure sounds familiar. Meanwhile, Jimmy is antsy to leave and impatient. They gave me, look, I'm validated for the day, all right? Five stickers, six stickers, I don't know from stickers, because I was in that court back there saving people's lives. Oh, so. gee, you know, that's swell. Thank you for restoring my faith in a legal system. Now, you either pay the three dollars or go and get an additional sticker. By now, another vehicle is behind Jimmy, blocking him from backing you up. Reveal, no way he's paying. The big reveal, we missed the big reveal. 
that, that was the line we revealed. Let me back it up then. <laughs> We show There's the attendant. The words, holy shit. We show the attendant, holy shit, it's Mike Armentrout. What's he doing here? Neither of these two men know each other from Adam, by the way, nor do they care to. Okay. Right. And then I say. Yeah, you say what you say. And then I say this. I yeah. go, well, gee, that's swell. Yeah. Thank you. For restoring my faith in the legal system. Now, either pay the three dollars or go and get an additional sticker. There's another vehicle behind Jimmy now blocking him from backing up. No way is he paying three bucks. Money's tight. Son of a... Fine, I'm going back. Going back there. Lift the, do the thing already. Mike hands him his ticket, then lifts the guard arm. Jimmy Great job. Turns. Employee of the month right there. <laughs> <coughs> we find ourselves at Loyola's Cafe, scene 12. We're in a booth, close. Coffee gets stirred by a woman's manicured hand. Her other hand rests atop her husband's. I'm just fuzzy as to why you think he needs a lawyer. We reveal Craig and Betsy Kettleman. I mean, Craig, the way you run your office, beyond reproach. Beyond reproach? I'm, I'm a stickler, he's you know. He's a stickler. For... With the money, he's definitely a stickler. He's certainly not guilty of some... Certainly not. He's innocent of any wrongdoing. That much is clear to me. I don't, I don't go looking for guilty people to represent. <laughs> Jeez, who needs that aggravation, right? Look, I only know what I read in the paper. But here's the thing. Typically, when money goes missing from the county treasury, and what, what's the figure, uh... 1.6 million? It's an accounting discrepancy. A discrepancy, absolutely. So <laughs> typically when that happens, the police they look at the treasurer. And since that person is, you know, uh, yeah, I just think maybe a little proactivity may be in order. I, I think I'd look guilty if I hired a lawyer. <laughs> Actually, it's getting arrested that makes people look guilty, <laughs> even the innocent ones. And let me tell you, innocent people get arrested all the time, and they find themselves in a little room with a detective who acts like he's their best friend. Talk to me, he says. Help me uh, clear this thing up. You don't need a lawyer. Only guilty people need lawyers. And boom, that's where it all goes south. That's when you want someone in your corner, someone who will fight tooth and nail, someone who will, in fact, already have your defense strategy mapped out in advance. Lawyers, huh? We're like health insurance. You hope you'll never need it, but man, oh man, not having it? <laughs> so uh, how would we proceed if we decided to... Uh... Jimmy's way ahead of him. He produces a one-page legal document, which he lays before them, as well as a pen. This is a letter of engagement. Very simple, straightforward. Please, by all means, read it closely. If you sign it, I can get to work on that strategy of ours this very afternoon. Mr. Kettleman eyes his wife, who scans the letter and seems to see nothing wrong with it. Mr. Kettleman picks up the pen. We're close on Jimmy, for whom time slows down. Jimmy plays it cool, of course, but for him, signing Mr. Kettleman would be like Ahab catching the white whale. He holds his breath. Jimmy's POV, the pen clicks open in dreamy slow motion. In this specialty ultra macro shot, the huge ballpoint tip lazily descends to the paper. It impacts the dotted line, leaving an ink spot. This is it. This is the golden moment when Jimmy lands his first big client. It's really happening until... Craig. <laughs> <laughs> Think maybe we should sleep on it. Uh, sure. We should do that, yeah. Don't, don't, don't you think, Mr. McGill? Uh, please, call me Jimmy. Uh, absolutely. No rush. Oh, you know what, Craig? We gotta pick up the kids. Uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you for the, the coffee and the advice. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. Uh, oh, and here, uh, that's got my number. Handing them a matchbook with James and McGill, a lawyer you can trust printed on the cover, all smiles and waves as the Kettlemans exit the restaurant. Alone in the booth, he slurps his coffee and glares into space. Fuck. He turns and peers out the window. His POV, we see the Kettlemans round their modest vehicle, a late 80s Mercury Sable station wagon. And we can't hear the discussion, but Mrs. Kettleman's body language is very clear. No, we're not signing with the very first lawyer we meet. She climbs behind the wheel of the Sable, very much the driver in this relationship. Jimmy sighs, but he's not ready to give up yet. Fishing out his wallet to pay the bill, we see he's got six bucks to his name. We now cut to a suburban street in the afternoon. We see the Suzuki Esteem zoom past. We cut inside, and Jimmy holds the phone to his ear. He's in mid-conversation, balancing a credit card atop the wheel and squinting to read it while he drives. Uh, 243627, expiration 4, 2004. And the, the key word is classy, all right? Super, super classy. Use only <laughs> flowers that look expensive but aren't. And the note should say, uh, <clears throat> Dear Betsy and Craig, Best wishes from your stickler for justice, James McGill, okay? And McGill is spelled, oh, wait, what? 
No, 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 run it again. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's paid up. Run it again. Kabam! Some skateboarders come flashing out of nowhere and slams across the hood of Jimmy's car. He cracks the windshield before he tumbles out of sight. The Suzuki slides to a stop. Oh, shit. Jimmy sits here motionless for a second, breathing fast. He just had the piss scared out of him. Driver's door swings open and Jimmy climbs out, dreading what he'll find. Nearby on the pavement lies a young dude who is groaning softly. This is Cal, as Jimmy impotently wonders how to tend to him. Oh my God, oh my God. A second lanky red-headed skateboarder, Lars, comes gliding into frame with a late 90s camcorder in hand, and it quickly becomes apparent to us that Lars is a dead ringer for the guy moaning away on the asphalt. Lars and Cal are identical twins. Cal, Cal, are you okay? Look at me, buddy, say something. What did you do, man? What did you do to my brother? Oh, Jesus. I think I'm okay, man. I'm, ah, ah. Stay low, just stay low, dude. Jesus, we gotta call. Why don't you look where you're going? He's making a turn. He came out of nowhere. You freaking hit him, man. You ran him over. I got the I got the whole thing on video. Lars, it was an accident. He didn't mean to. Look, let me just... Ah, okay, yeah. It's my leg. <laughs> Is it broke? You broke his leg. Why are you all, like, driving around and not looking? You're driving around breaking people's legs. Somebody call the cops. Somebody call the cops? Lars bellows to anyone who'll listen. A few lick of hang out in the distance watching, but they're not eager to get involved. Lars, chill out, don't. Police, police see ya. I'm calling him myself, I'm gonna call him. Lars fumbles for his phone, starts to dial. Sitting on the asphalt, Cal grips his injured leg and sadly shrugs to Jimmy. Boy, Jimmy must be in a full-blown panic, right? Wrong. In fact, the angrier Lars gets, the more Jimmy's anxiety seems to ebb away. It gets replaced with a kind of inscrutable watchfulness. Finally, in his best Kevin Spacey, a feckless deadpan. Gee, fellas, I'm awfully sorry. I mean, how much do you think it'd cost for me to make this right? Lars, his phone to his ear, snorts and shakes his head. But peacemaker Cal looks to his brother searchingly. Dude, let's find it in our hearts to forgive. Finally, Cal considers, and then... I don't know. 500 bucks. Jimmy considers, nodding. A beat of silence. Then, he kicks seated Cal right in the broken leg. Ow, what the hell, man? Hey, Sideshow Bobs, I'll give you a 9.6 for technique, but choice of victim, 0, 0.0. I'm a lawyer, you couple of mongoloids. <laughs> Furthermore, does this steaming pile, this steaming pile of crap scream payday to you two? <laughs> Seriously, the only way this entire car is worth 500 would be if it had a $300 hooker sitting in the front seat. <laughs> now let's talk about what you owe me for my windshield. Knowing they're intellectually outgunned, Lars and Cal jump on their skateboards and beat it, Jimmy yelling after them. I'll take a check! Jimmy watches them go, then studies his shittier car. We cut to a nail salon on the salon floor close on a woman's foot as it gets decalloused with pumice stick. We hear a murmur of Vietnamese being spoken. We're in a strip mall nail salon. Four or five Vietnamese women chatter to one another as they tend to their female clients. Hanging bells on the door jingle as Jimmy enters. He's got a big smile for all his pearls of the Orient. Chao Chi, Chao Chi Kong. <laughs> the ladies all beam and greet him in their native language. They're happy to see Jimmy. The one exception is Mr. Mrs. Nguyen, the salon's formidable owner. Chao Chi, Mrs. Nguyen. Uh, my, don't you look. Uh, is there any mail? Frowning, the older woman cans him a short stack of envelopes. Jimmy gives her a little tip of the hat, heads for the back of the place, shuffling through his mail. You work for people who make sex with chopped off head? <coughs> oh, <laughs> was it in the paper? I hear about it from my cousin. Why? Why you work for those people? Just lucky, I guess. Cucumber water for customers only. This is Jimmy stops to pour a drink from a water dispenser with cucumber slices floating in it. He gives up, disappears in the back of the salon. We're in a rear storage hallway as Jimmy passes through. Area stacked high with business supplies and a fluorescent tube with a faulty ballast flickers overhead. When he reaches a plain scuffed door marked James M. McGill Esquire Law Corporation, we realize this is the office that Jimmy has. Back in Jimmy's office, it's dark. Jimmy flicks on the lights, cluttered and depressing. That about sums this place up. The office is barely big enough for one person. Jimmy shuts the door behind him. Now that he's alone, his smile fades. Christ, what a day. He pulls loose the knot on his tie, scooches sideways through the narrow path to his desk, plopping down behind it. Here, there's a dated old multi-line desk phone. Jimmy punches the voicemail button. You have zero messages. <laughs> Jimmy isn't surprised. Business is slow. He considers, then wriggles his fingers at the phone. <clears throat> it's as if he's casting a magical spell on it, compelling it to ring. It doesn't. Jimmy gives up, sifts through his mail. Close angles, nothing but bill after bill after bill. He stops shuffling when he comes across an envelope. Very expensive bellowing. The return address is that of Albuquerque law firm Hamlin, Hamlin, and McGill. Jimmy considers. Guardedly hopeful, he slits the envelope, and inside there's a cover letter. There's also a cashier's check. Jimmy studies it for a long time. The check is written to him personally, and it's made out in the amount of $26,000. Holy shit. 
We've seen how broke Jimmy is. We know he's in dire financial straits. Now, hallelujah. But Jimmy is not overjoyed about this sudden financial windfall. Actually seems to piss him off to the degree that he now tears the check in half. And off a of grim Jimmy, we end act one. <coughs> act two, we're in an elevator call button, filling a frame and finger jabs it, lighting it up. Jimmy waits for an elevator in a place we don't recognize. It's a new day. And Jimmy's wearing his best acrylic blend suit. He's alone here, taking a deep breath, stealing himself. He glances over to a trash can which stands nearby. Its shiny metal side is prominently dented. Jimmy stares at it, lost in thought. Ding. The arrival of the elevator snaps him out of it. He steps aboard. We cut to a lobby. The door slides open on a brand new Jimmy. Now he's confident, a master of the universe. Strolling out of the elevator into the white shoe world of Hamlin, Hamlin McGill, this place is everything a law firm should be. It's big and airy, screaming money. Everyone's well-dressed, right down to the paralegals and assistants. As busy people come and go, Jimmy smiles and nods hello. Knows every last man and woman. Marvin. Hey, Alice. Looking good, Kevin. The employees he passes are reserved. It's as if they like Jimmy but feel awkward around him. There's a hint of pity in their eyes. Jimmy ignores it. With his fingertips, he beats a drum on the reception counter. Oh, sorry. Hey, Brenda, where's Lord Vader? South Conference Room. Uh, uh, he's not quite ready for you yet. How about you wait out here? Yeah, how about I don't? <coughs> Jimmy strolls out of sight. The worried receptionist glances after him, picks up her phone. We then cut to a conference room. Across the room from us, at the far end of this mile-long conference table sits Howard Hamlin and six of his junior partners. They've got coffee and danishes and are midway through an informal morning meeting. Jimmy walks right in without knocking, finding himself alone at the other end of this ridiculously long table. He throws out his arms and bellows his best Ned Beatty impersonation. You have meddled with the primal forces of nature, Mr. Hamlin, and I won't have it! <laughs> Way in the distance, <laughs> Hamlin and his juniors sit blinking and staring at him. They're not big fans of the movie network, apparently. <laughs> a young female lawyer, Kim, was already on the phone when Jimmy arrived, into it low and flat. It's okay, Brenda, we got it. Sorry, it's this table. Something just comes over me. What can we do for you, Jimmy? Jimmy plops down in an empty chair. He reaches in his jacket, pulls out a handful of confetti, which used to be that big cashier's check. He sprinkles it on the tabletop. You can tell me what this 26000 is supposed to be for. It's money for Chuck. Isn't that what you wanted? A measly 26 grand? Jesus, you're like Peter Minuit with the Indians, throwing some beads and shells while you're at it. It's a start. There'll be more, unless you're just going to tear them all up. And why was the check made, out, check made out to me? Why not Chuck? Can he make his way to the bank? I just assumed it would be best money to go through you. But we'll do it any way you want. See, if I didn't know any better, I'd say this was some kind of half-assed bribe. Where you throw a little money at me and the sad hope I'll somehow forget what you owe my client. Wow. No, not even remotely correct. This thing isn't going away, Howard. What Chuck did for this firm, and damn near single-handedly, one-third of this place belongs to him. What do you got here? Fifteen chairs? Five of these chairs are Chuck's. Three light fixtures? He'll take the middle one. Six danishes? You can have all the danishes you want, Jimmy. No, no, no. They're Chuck's danishes. Oh, and Chuck's not greedy. He'll only take two. Plus uh, $17 million. Yeah, somewhere in that ballpark. We'll know once we get the accountants in here poking around. In the meantime, no more penny ante checks designed to make it look like Chuck still works here. He doesn't, and he never will again, and it's time to do right by him and cash him out. So these are Chuck's wishes you're conveying? Yeah, this is what's best for him. And he has personally stated to you that it's his wish to withdraw from the firm? You see, that would surprise me. Well, it's been nearly a year since he set foot in here. I'm looking out for his best interest. So am I. I, for one, believe he's going to lick this thing. Until then, his office is just as he left it. His secretary is still on the payroll. If Chuck can call this an extended sabbatical, so can we. He's that important to us. You know what? Let's let a jury figure it out. They're going to love you, Howard. You're so down to earth and relatable. Jimmy rises to his feet, heads back the way he came. When he reaches the far end of the table, he once more bellows theatrically. And you will atone! More blank stares. Ned Beatty, network. For Christ's sake, guys. We're back in the lobby, close on the call button, a finger stabbing it. Once more, Jimmy waits for the elevator, this time to get the hell out of there. At the moment, he has a bit of privacy. As such, we get to see his true face. He's not as cool as a cucumber. Apparently, the meeting didn't go as hoped. Jimmy is beaten, and he knows it. Well, here comes Hamlin, headed our way. Jimmy snaps out of his funk. Hamlin offers him a big manila envelope, fat and heavy. Almost forgot this month's filings. 
You could save me some postage. Were you listening in there? Chuck doesn't work here anymore. You think I'm gonna help you establish a paper trail? <sighs> Jimmy. No, stop trying to pawn that shit off on him. You know, sometimes in our line of work, we get so caught up with the idea of winning that we forget to listen to our hearts. <laughs> <laughs> Give Chuck my love, will you? Hamlin walks off, heads for a nearby office. Jimmy glowers after him, asshole. Wait, it gets worse. For as Hamlin opens the door to this office, we catch a glimpse of the two clients who are waiting inside for him. Yep, you guessed it, Craig and Betsy Kettleman. Smiling at Hamlin, they greet each other warmly. Then the door shuts, and we're left out here in the cold. The wind goes out of Jimmy. He presses his forehead against the wall, jabbing the elevator button again. Find ourselves back on the uh, lower level, Elevator landing, ding, Jimmy steps off the elevator into the parking garage. Is he okay? Not really, because once he's alone down here, he kicks the shit out of that familiar dented trash can. Bang, 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 it dawns on us why the trash can is dented in the first place. Having finally managed to kick over the can, he stands here with his hands on his knees, panting for breath, and now we pull back to reveal something Jimmy can't see. Just around the corner is that young female lawyer from the conference room, Kim. She's leaning against a wall, smoking a cigarette. Oddly, all that ruckus just now didn't alarm her. Didn't make her look to see what's going on either. She's simply smoking and staring into space. Jimmy wanders out of the elevator landing, headed for the parked cars. But when he comes across Kim, he's neither startled nor embarrassed. Instead, he joins her. He too leans against the wall, staring into space. After a moment, he takes the cigarette from her lips, borrowing it for a puff or two. Jimmy blows smoke and sighs. He places the cigarette back in Kim's mouth, finally looking at her. Couldn't you just... You know I can't. Jimmy figured as much. He doesn't argue. Kim stubs her butt in the ashtray. Smoke breaks over. She exits without a word. Jimmy doesn't watch her go. He stays another beat, then wanders out of frame, headed for his car. Out of Act 2. Act 3, upscale cul-de-sac at night, headlights flare. Jimmy's esteem turns a corner. He drives past well-tended houses, their lights gleaming warmly in the night, and pulls into the driveway of the only house that's completely dark. Like the neighbors, this place is roomy and nicely designed, but not a single light shines. The house seems untended, deserted, a rotten tooth in a healthy mouth. Jimmy pulls two bulging plastic hefty bags and some groceries out of the trunk. He tucks some newspapers under one arm, goes to the mailbox, and removes a stack of mail. And now he does something very odd. In a routine he's followed a hundred times, Jimmy places his watch, key fob, and cell phone into the mailbox. With everything electronic or battery power hidden away, he lifts the bags and heads to the walkway. At the kitchen threshold, Jimmy makes a point of touching the drain pipe before unlocking the door. We hear the tick, tick, tick of a manual typewriter echoing from inside. We segue to the kitchen as Jimmy <coughs> enters. A voice calls from the next room. You ground yourself? Yeah. Like the rest of the house, the kitchen is illuminated by quietly hissing propane lanterns. In other words, no electric lights. Lantern lights flicker over jagged gaps where once stood the stove, refrigerator, and microwave. Jimmy opens a frat party igloo-sized cooler. Packaged food floats in melted ice. He leans down, turns about. Water girl goes from the cooler into a PVC pipe that runs to the outside world through a small ragged hole in the wall. Jimmy dumps the hefty bags in the cooler. <coughs> Turns out they're full of ice cubes. He closes the cooler and dries his hands on a towel. Raising a lantern, Jimmy heads deeper into the house. As he does, we pass flex conduits snaking from gashes in the sheetrock. The tick, tick, tick of the manual typewriter gets louder as Jimmy enters. We reveal the man himself, Charles McGill, Jimmy's older brother, a brilliant, truly decent man with a few problems. Surrounded by neatly organized stacks of papers and books, Chuck hunches over his manual Olympia, pecking out a letter. You gotta stop putting bacon on the list. That cooler's looking like a trichinosis stew. Chuck holds up a finger. Once a successful attorney and a named partner at Hamlin, Hamlin and McGill, Chuck's life has been destroyed by what seems to be a debilitating allergic reaction to electricity. Chuck tugs the letter out of the Olympia, giving it to Jimmy. Perfect timing. Professor Bronze Vogelson, University of Helsinki. You're gonna have to get it translated. Hungry to read the fresh papers, Chuck grabs a stack and lays them out on the mahogany dining table. He stands there, scanning the pages. Into right, Swedish? Finnish. I'm sure there's someone at the UNM who can do it. Check the language department. You do know I'm trying to build a legal practice, right? Vogelson's working on the effects of electromagnetic fields on zebrafish. He might, oh, the Financial Times. You missed it, so I thought, you know, Thank you. Not? I know it's expensive. Here, come on. I don't expect you to go out of pocket. Go ahead, reimburse yourself. Thank you. Chuck, can, can you sit down a minute? Are you all right? You look peaked. I'm, I'm fine. Please. You're not, you're not in trouble. Chuck, 
<laughs> you've got to cash out. You've got to. Again, really? You know, there's no other way. And I don't, I don't want to, I know you don't want to hear it, but it's got to happen. You know I'm going to beat this. You know I'm going to get better. Yeah, sure I do. And then there's nothing to talk about. I will beat this. I will go back to work. Ergo, a falsis principis pro fecinski. Meaning? That's not the... Meaning? <laughs> that's the one about false principles. You will proceed from false principles. Your argument is built on quicksand. Therefore, it collapses. You're not listening. Fine. Let's take this to its logical conclusion. In order to pay up my share, suppose my partners are forced to liquidate the firm. Then what? That's their problem. My clients are out in the cold. My case is scattered to the wind. 126 people lose their jobs. Hamlin, Hamlin, McGill closes. What happens to your cronies in the mailroom? The assistants, the paralegals, the janitorial staff, all of them out on the street. Your friend Kim, a promising career, over and done with. Is that what you want? Hamlin owes you everything. You built that place while he was out at Four Hills working on his bunker shop. Well, let's not exaggerate. I helped. All the more reason not to tear it down for a little bit of cash. Chuck, listen to me. All right, I'm drowning. I'm going under for the third time with these bullcrap overflow bull public crap. Yeah, bullcrap. <laughs> Overflow PD cases at $700 a shot. Public defender work is some of the best experience there is. It's pure law. I had a case the other day, three clients, depositions, voir dire, jury trial, the whole nine yards. What I take home? $700. I might as well, 700 bucks. I might as well head down to Skid Row and sell plasma. You're representing people who have nowhere else to turn. Money's beside the point. Money's not beside the point. Money is the point. I keep telling you. Have patience. There are no shortcuts. Do good work, and the clients will come. Hey, Chuck, my hand to God, I didn't want to say this, but you are broke. I can't carry us both. I've been trying like hell, but I can't. You're saying what? You think you have to provide for me? I never asked you for that. You didn't have to ask. I, I have done my damnedest, but the day of reckoning is here. Soon you're going to be out on the street with all the electromagnetism in the world raining down on you like hellfire. Picture that and tell me money's beside the point. That's what has you all worked up. Jimmy, there's nothing to worry about. Here. Chuck opens a drawer and pulls out a check. He hands it over to Jimmy. Jimmy holds it up to the light. It features the distinctive Hamlin, Hamlin, and McGill logo. What is this? It's a stipend. There's going to be one every week. $857 from Hamlin, Hamlin, McGill? I will pay them back, every penny. I didn't want to take anything, but Howard was very insistent. I'll pay you back, too. Wait, Hamlin was here? It's not like I'm a recluse. He put his cell phone in the mailbox. He understands the situation. He grounded himself. Of course. Fuck. Hamlin has outmaneuvered Jimmy. With a bleak glance, Jimmy notices among the papers stacked on Chuck's desk is the thick HHM envelope, the one Hamlin tried to give to Jimmy earlier. And the two of you agreed that since, as everybody knows, you're going back to work any day now, the firm might as well help you, what, make ends meet? That's correct, minus the sarcasm. <laughs> Hamlin's making a chump out of you. I am going to get better. I'm going to go back to work, and I'm picking up where I left off. I understand you're trying to look out for me, but you're missing the bigger picture. So, um, I was thinking, Vanguard Law, that sounds kind of important, or uh, Gibraltar Legal Advisors, like, like The Rock, has a nice ring to it. Or, or what about keeping it simple? AAA Law, four A's. That would put you right at the top of the yellow pages. Good Chuck. Howard brought this. He's concerned. Chuck produces one of the James and McGill matchbooks. You have to admit it could be confusing. Hamlin, Hamlin McGill, James M. McGill. It's my name. I was born with it. Still. I'm not supposed <laughs> to use my own name on Hamlin's say-so? What's he going to do, sue me? No one wants to create an adversarial situation. I'm sure Howard would gladly pay the cost of uh, new matchbooks and so on. It's, it's simply a matter of professional courtesy. Chuck, whose side are you on? You know sides here. But Jimmy, listen, wouldn't you rather build your own identity? Why ride on someone else's coattails? Off Jimmy, struggling to to contain a simmering rage, we find ourselves in blackness. A door swings open, revealing we are inside Chuck's mailbox, looking out. Jimmy's hands grab his cell phone key fob and the rest. We cut inside his Suzuki esteem. 
Jimmy slams the car door. He sits in the motionless esteem stewing, anger building in waves. He slowly turns to glare through the spider web of cracks in the windshield, jagged lines crisscrossing Jimmy's face as he stares at the shattered safety glass, a storm brewing in his eyes. All right, you wanna dance? Let's dance. Act four. We're tight on curving concrete. The scamming skateboard twins carve and grind inside a concrete half pipe. These guys are fucking awesome. Cal zooms up past the lip and hangs suspended in the air for a gut-wrenching moment. He rushes back down and comes to a scraping stop. He saw something up there. Trouble. Lars pulls up next to his brother and follows his gaze up to a figure looming above. It's Jimmy, a man on a mission. Hey, fellas, we got business. How'd you find us? They step out of the half pipe, and we widen to reveal we're at Exterior Municipal Skate Park. Skaters roll back and forth. Yeah, who wouldn't look for skateboarders here? I know, it's kind of eerie, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, whoa, 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 come on. Give me 30 seconds and we're square. You owe me that much for the windshield, right? It could be the most profitable 30 seconds of your lives. Profitable? Lars and Cal glance at each other, off the twins, cautious but definitely intrigued. We time cut a couple minutes later as the boys listens, ready to take off in an instant, as Jimmy makes his pitch. And there's nothing of the carnival barker to him now. He's almost misty-eyed. I want to tell you about a young guy. It's about your age. He lived a long way from here in a town called Cicero, Illinois. And in Cicero, he was the man. When he strolled by, all the corner boys would give him the high five, all the finest babes would smile at him and hope that he would smile back. Jimmy, they called him Slippin' Jimmy, and everybody wanted to be his friend. Slippin' Jimmy? What kind of name is that? Okay, I'll tell you. <laughs> now, the winners in Cicero, now they're murder. You boys growing up out here in the Golden West, you don't know. I'm talking cold that'll freeze a snot right in your nose. I'm talking wind that cuts through your coat and carves you up like a Ginsu knife. Truth is, most folks in Cicero were scared of winter, but not Jimmy. Jimmy'd spent all summer long waiting, and in September, when September finally rolled around, he'd feel that first cold wind sweeping off Lake Michigan, and he knew it was coming. What was he waiting for? Was it Christmas? Was it Kwanzaa? Better. It was slip and fall season. As soon as it was cold enough, Jimmy'd find a nice smooth patch of ice. State Street was good. Michigan Avenue was better. And he'd pick his spot, and when it was nice and busy, he'd step out on the ice, and wham! He'd biff it so hard, people would come running from five blocks away. Yeah, but did he collect? Did he collect. Jimmy had it dialed in. One good fall, he'd make six or eight grand easy. That'd keep him in old Milwaukee and Maui Waui right through Labor Day. Eight grand. No lie? Eight grand. And I look at you guys, and I see potential. Look, skateboard's a nice wrinkle. Makes it a year-round gig, and clearly you can take a header. But I gotta ask you, your best day ever? What'd you clear? Six thirty. Six hundred and thirty bucks for one fall? No, that was two. Oof! Two hits in a day. Even young as you are, that's gotta hurt. True that. Okay, I got a job for you. How's two grand sound? Two grand, one hit. One hit. Plus, you get to learn from the best. Off the twins, they're in. We find ourselves exterior of the Kettleman Street, a POV, a familiar Mercury Sable wagon parked in the driveway. Now that we get a better look, we might notice one of those stick figure family decals on the rear window. Mom, Dad, the two kids hiking with backpacks. A gleaming brand new Baylander cruiser towers over the car. The eye-catching mailbox has a metal topper in the shape of a tea kettle with the letter K cut out of its center. Nice boat. Yeah, discreet, like a stripper pole in a mosque. Forget the boat. See the car? You know what that is? I don't know. Station wagon. Mercury. 1988 Mercury Sable wagon. Remember it. Burn it into your brains. Sure. You got it? Okay, now close your eyes. What color is it? Uh, brown. Yeah, medium sandalwood. Now keep those eyes closed. What does the license plate start with? Is it a four? Give the man a gold star. Who are these people? Uh, they're my clients. They just don't know it yet. As Jimmy pulls away, we cut to a mini mall intersection. Jimmy's brought them to an urban intersection near a pleasant looking cafe, complete with outdoor seating. A Betsy Kettleman's her name. Every weekday between 225 and 250, she comes through here on her way to pick up her kids from Kit Carson Elementary. You need a spot where she's gonna slow down, am I right? Yeah. All right, there you go. She slows down, she hangs a right, and that's when you do it, just like you did to me. 
you go ass over tea kettle. I mean, make it a blue ribbon special. When she gets out of the car, you're suffering St. Sebastian. You, you're the hammer. You get in her face. Scare the bejesus out of her. Give me your phone. It's kind of busy here. What if someone sees Yeah, witnesses are good. Witnesses are pressure. As soon as you've got her good and rattled, you call for an ambulance. But see, really, you're calling me. I'm number one on your speed dial right next to your weed dealer. You call me, I outfoot it over here. I happen to be driving by. I stop to see what the trouble is, and here's the most important part. You don't know me. We've never met. You got it? Sure. Now, see, I'm Mrs. K's white knight. Now, we, we go mano a mano. You light into me. You get nasty. I mean, no touching. You leave the hair alone. But <laughs> other than that, open season. You know, yell, stomp, call me a douchebag. I'll keep my cool, give you back the razzmatazz. After she's seen the fireworks, you fold like a lawn chair. Happy ending. When do we get our money? After. You get paid when I get paid. I'm the rising tide that raises all dinghies. Pop quiz, what's the car? Mercury Sable Wagon, Baby Poop Brown. Do you know me? No. Uh-uh. Damn straight. Go with God. Back to the Kettleman's. All is quiet. Well, I'm just so very glad I happen to be driving past. Happy to be a help. No, no, I wouldn't think of taking your money for this. No, the embezzlement case? Sure, I'd be happy to talk it over. Jimmy's POV looking worried and preoccupied. Mrs. Kettleman heads over to her sable wagon. Electrified, Jimmy dials his cell. Two-minute warning. Cut to the mini mall, new angle on Lars. Station near a stop sign, Lars eyes the oncoming traffic while he talks in his cell with Jimmy. Got it. He hangs up, raises two fingers to his brother. We're on. Tension building, these guys may be scammers, but they take their work very seriously. We rack back to Cal. He begins stretching with Lars, eyes on the traffic. In the distance, rounding a corner, the brown Mercury Sable approaches. Lars flashes a heads up gesture to Cal, jumps on his board, slides up the street towards his brother. As he passes Cal, the boys fist bump. Lars scrapes to a stop behind Cal, raises his camcorder. He hits the record button. Eyes narrowing, Cal rolls towards the intersection. Picking up speed, judging distances. Getting the timing right is an art. Cal's a master. The station wagon approaches the intersection, slows and hangs a right. We angle behind Cal, rushing toward the station wagon. Tight on Cal's face, he hits the front passenger side of the car and tumbles. The world swirls behind him. Sky, car, street, sky. Inside the station wagon, Cal's helmet whacks the windshield with a teeth rattling crunch. New angle, low on the pavement, Cal slams off the hood, momentum grinding him over the blacktop. He comes to a stop on the foreground. The station wagon lurches to a stop. Playing his part as before, Lars rushes to his brother. Oh my God, oh my God, Cal. Cal, are you okay? Look at me, buddy, say something. You the freaked out victim, right? Lars glances over, but no one emerges from the car. We're high and wide. The station wagon idles 20 feet away from the two skaters. The stillness is odd. Customers come out to see what's going on. Even Cal raises his head and cuts his eyes over to the wagon. Is she coming out or what? Guess he's not hurt so bad. Come on already. Tires chirping, the station wagon takes off like a bat out of hell. This was not part of the plan. What? Off the brothers gaping. <laughs> Off the brothers gaping. We cut inside the Suzuki. Jimmy glances at his Timex. The skater should have called by now. He lifts his cell but doesn't dial. A moment, of a moment of indecision. Should he call the boys? Suddenly his phone rings. She took off on us. She what? It was textbook, man. We were diamonds, but then she just took off. Wait, wait, she hit and run? That's what I'm saying. She bailed and wailed. Stay right there. I'm coming to get you. Screw that, man. We're following her. Following her how? We got our ways, yo. Reveal City Street, the station wagon drives past. A few car lengths behind, a refrigerator delivery tr cube truck head in the same direction. We pan with the truck to reveal that the twins are clinging to the back of the truck, using it to pull them along Marty McFly style. It's called skitching. They stay low on the boards at speed while keeping the station wagon in sight. Cal peers around the edge of the truck. The wagon is just ahead. No way Mrs. K can tell they're following her. But Jimmy's brain is in overdrive as we intercut. Okay, fine. New plan. New plan. You know me. I'm your lawyer. Got that? <laughs> I'll meet you at the school. She's way past the school. She hooked a left on Juan Tabo. She's heading into Holiday Park. Did stay with her. When she gets where she's going, wherever it is, just wait for me. Don't do anything. Wait for what? You haven't been right even once, slipping Jimmy my ass. <laughs> Look, kid. You just fell into the honeypot. Understand? Hit and run is a felony. So what? So what? So more money. He says we fell in the honeypot. He says more money. So what do we need him for? <laughs> Good question. Lars hangs up on Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy yells into the phone. Hey, Lars, Cal, whichever one I'm, damn it, come on, come on. It rings, Jimmy winces his thrash metal blast. <sighs> Son of a bitch. He drives on, no one cuts out Jimmy McGill. 
We find ourselves exterior of a well-tended older two-story house on a tranquil street. The station wagon pulls into the driveway. The skateboarders roll up moments later. As they hop off their boards, Lars slaps Cal. Your leg. Oh, yeah. Cal grabs hold of Lars for the support and hobbles on his broken leg as they head across the front yard. The sable's door opens, and four rubber cane nubs hit the driveway. A tiny, grandmotherly woman pulls herself out. She freezes at the sight of the angry twins rushing their way. We're going to call her Abuelita. In other words, the St. Mrs. Kettleman. The boys hit the wrong car. Decal's not there either. Uh, yo, yo, hold up. Yeah, you. What's the matter with you? You hit and run. You ran him over. You felonied my brother. <laughs> Habla English? We call la policia. La policia gonna be pissed. <laughs> I see you hit him. Wamp! Espresso rapido, now you pay. Make with the dinero. Dinero? <laughs> Righteous dinero. Very nervous, Abuelita waves for the boys to follow her. She makes her way to the front door. That's what I'm talking about. Cal leans on his brother as they lope into the house after Abuelita. The door closes behind them, holding a beat, something ominous about the prolonged moment. Off this, we're back inside the esteem with Jimmy. He drives the streets near the last position of the boys, searching for his clients. He's yet working out yet another alternate plan. Yeah, their parents are clients, so when I heard, Mrs. Kettleman, Betsy, what a surprise. And what are you doing here? Serious? Oh my goodness, oh no, no, this doesn't have to be like this. <laughs> Find ourselves back outside Abuelita's house. The sun shines, birds chirp. Jimmy's esteem cruises through and does not stop. Did he miss the house? The esteem quickly reverses back into the shot. Jimmy Parks climbs out and a glance at the station wagon and the discarded skateboards confirms this must be the place. Straightening his tie, he charges up the front porch. Jimmy raps on the door. Officer of the court. Silence from inside, unless, is that a TV? He goes to the window, tries peering through the lace curtains. No dice. Jimmy raps on the door again. Open up, officer of the court. Open up in the name of the law. Side angle. Door opens. Good afternoon. I'm... A meaty fist shoves a pistol directly into Jimmy's forehead. He has time for a single terrified breath before another hand firmly grips him by the collar. Jimmy offers no resistance as he's tugged inside. After a beat, a man leans out of the doorway and calmly scans the street, checking for witnesses. As he turns to us, that fight flattened nose, shaved head, holy shit. He's the one, the only, Tuco Salamanca. Oh. What has Jimmy McGill gotten himself into? Taking his sweet time, Tuco ducks back inside. The door closes with a click. Very wide off the quiet house, birds chirping. We end the episode. Wonderful. Um, Peter, Vince, do you guys want to say anything before we disband? Great job. <laughs> that was awesome. That was, I can't wait to shoot it. That was great. I, this whole thing was just a scheme so I would get to act with you. Uh, thank, thank you guys so much. This is, uh, this, this is uh, as I already effused downstairs, but uh, it's a dream come true. And this is a dream, uh, right now, it's a dream cast, including the writers. You're all cast. <laughs> anyway. Thank you guys so much, Bob. Thanks to you. Thanks.